My name is Tomasz Bon and I am head of machine learning team in Digital Fingerprints, a Polish startup developing continuous authentication system based on behavioral biometrics. Uh, the idea behind it is based on a unique way of using mouse, keyboard and mobile. Using that, uh, we can build a machine learning model to verify your identity. Uh, okay, for now it's the end of the story. You can find out more about it during Big Data Conference Europe. See you there. Okay, I get the information that we are live, so let's start the presentation. From internet access devices usage to behavioral model. I will want you to introduce uh, into this, in my humble opinion, quite interesting area of um, machine learning development. And this area is quite I know, as far as I know. So let's spend a few minutes to um, to, to introduce uh, into this area. <clears throat> okay, uh, a short short puzzle for a start. What what is the thing on on this picture? Uh, this thing is uh, really small. Mm, okay, by the way, we will live in the era of miniaturization, so why it should be big? And the thing is uh, light, only five grams. Uh, so, a uh, few seconds to think, to find the ideas. Mm, okay, and time to answer. It's a fingerprint reader working through USB. Mm, cost of this thing? Just around 20 euros. Uh, so, it's not an expensive thing and can be commonly used as authentication tool. Of course, we can uh, find other approaches to authentication. The fingerprint is just just the first example of authentication methods. Others are uh, PIN or password, face recognition or iris recognition. Uh, the important thing is uh, all of them require user engagement. So, user has to be aware of what is doing. If he or she is putting PIN or password or using facial eye recognition, uh, he or she has to know about it. Mm, so, I don't want to conduct a business discussion about pros and cons of uh, this authentication method. I just uh, want you to remember that we have to be uh, we have to be aware uh, when we are using these methods that's that's the basic assumption for all of them uh, and now it's a time for behavioral biometrics uh, which is a field of a study related to measure uniquely identifying and measurable patterns in human activities so uh, it's a, a different approach to physical biometrics which involves innate human characteristics like fingerprints or iris uh, uh, patterns the characteristic which i present uh, before and the main difference between behavior and physical biometrics is that the first one does not require that user is aware of authentication process. So, user can make normal activities and the way in which he is doing these activities is used to conduct authentication. Uh, the main field in which behavioral biometrics is developing uh, is the way of computer using. So, we are trying to analyze the behavior in which you use the computer through external devices like keyboard mouse uh, or or touchpad uh, how how to collect a data for it mm. so an average man uses many devices each day keyboard mouse tablet mobile phone 
when we make something regularly, uh, we are making habits. It's a uh, it's natural way of uh, human, of how the human works, how we learn things. We are trying to make some habits. And each of us has his own specific way of using these devices. Uh, just like with human fingerprint, our be behavior is unique. Uh, the way we pressing keys, uh, moving mouse, or uh, swapping the screen on tablet or on mobile is uh, characteristic for each of us. Uh, so if it's characteristic for each of us, then it can be used as authentication tool. Uh, okay, so <laughs> brace yourself, data lake is coming. Uh, imagine this. Uh, each user has many devices. Each device has many sensors. And each sensor generates data. And uh, you have many users, thousands, millions. Uh, what to do with, with this data? Uh, with this quite big stream of, of, of data. Uh, you organize the data lake. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite natural approach. And of course, it's, it's not bad to organize uh, data lake. It's, uh, it's normal approach, assuming that you are making it correctly. And there was a lot of discussion about it during this conference. Uh, but and uh, uh, there is always a bad word in different presentations, so uh, in different discussion also. So let's focus on, on this bad word. But uh, what next? You have the data lake, and and what can we do with this uh, with this data? Uh, so uh, feature engineering. Uh, we have moved from one AI keyword a data lake to another AI keyword, uh, feature engineering. And uh, I think that by, by the way, it could be a quite effective recipe for a good AI presentation, uh, efficient AI presentation, maybe better word. Move from one AI keyword to another AI keyword. Uh, it can guarantee that each auditor will, will find something for himself in, in your presentation. But I, I will not use this recipe here. Just uh, just another another AI keyword and end of that. Uh, okay, to, to the facts. Uh, raw data from uh, devices is really far from um, data which could be used for modeling, for bu building machine learning model. Uh, Timestamps of key pressing, uh, timestamps of mouse location, number of keystrokes, we have to somehow uh, reorganize them. We have to uh, be. We have to build features from uh, this data to to make a ne next step to go into modeling. So let's spend a few moments on some examples of feature engineering in behavioral biometrics. Mm, keyboard feature. Uh, it can be based on key down and key up uh, events rhythm. Let's, for example, take a look at pianists. We can choose several of them and we can give one song for each of them. And each of them will play it differently. Uh, we can say each of them will play it in his own style. And the same thing is with the rhythm of typing. It can be quite unique uh, for each of us. So uh, we can use it to, and we can characterize it by some metrics like flying time. So it is time between releasing the previous key and pressing the next one and uh, dwell time time between pressing and releasing the same key. Uh, these two quite simple metrics in this case are considered for pairs of keys, pairs of events. Uh, but we can also extend this uh, pairs into the groups. 
so we can build similar measures but on the groups of keys uh, so we'll go even further with with this uh, with this feature which can help us in making verification uh, more precise hmm. uh, mouse feature the first example of mouse feature what you can obtain from a mouse position sensor um, mouse device give much give us much more possibilities to characterize user so the simplest info is to use the point position x and y coordinates with time but we can go further uh, you can define no action periods uh, you can define button pushing uh, wheel scrolling uh, you can also define movements, mouse movements of different types and different types of velocities and accelerations. So there is really a, a big amount of uh, approaches to build a feature using timestamp. But uh, there is also another level of problem uh, in this feature, uh, the sampling frequency. Mm, so we have to decide how often we want to dump the information about mouse posi position. Uh, if we will have, if we'll make it too often, then we'll, we can get a lot of different, uh, a lot of similar position. And then we will have to filter it. So we, we have to find uh, some, an, some additional method to clear the data uh, from the uh, another point of view if we will have uh, too rare sampling frequency uh, it will be hard to build the model because the uh, the frequency will be too too small too too rare uh, data so another problem the problem is i can say uh, on two levels one build this feature, uh, invent this feature, so uh, define it. And the second, uh, decide how often you want to sample the mouse location. Uh, another example of mouse feature um, is the approach based on uh, dense areas analysis. Uh, so instead of bringing down mouse activities to time series like in the previous example when we are building different me measures like acceleration in different timestamps uh, we can treat mouse activities so mouse position as a heat map and uh, we can analyze activities areas so in this case we are uh, we have more a problem of image recognition so it's closer to uh, neural networks the convolutional neural networks uh, so it's to totally different approach to the same problem and recent years brought increasing number of researchers about mouse feature so these two examples are just uh, two of many uh, approaches to the same problem mm. but there is general general i can say problem with these approaches uh, they were made on quite small sample number of users generally between 10 or 20 users and how to how we can transform these approaches to big scale learning by which i mean the problem of learning thousands or sometimes even millions of users. Uh, the problem is even more complicated because general approach in behavioral modeling is to build dedicated model for each user. Uh, this can give you a good prediction quality. But uh, moreover, each, each feature, so keyboard, mouse, etc., requires own model. So we have to train more than one model for each user. And quite probably we will have to build another one 
to link them all into one final score. Uh, technically, it could be solved with some kind of ensemble or stacking model, uh, but uh, I do not treat them as a single model. Uh, you have to train many separate models to get ensemble or stacking, so it's generally the same as training a few separate models. So uh, the thing is that we have to build many models for each user. And we still considering that we have many users. So this leads us straightforwardly to training time, which generally should be low. And further to cost of training, which of course also should be low. So the question is, how to combine it with model quality, especially when you have thousands or millions of users. Be fast, be light, and still be precise. Mm, so few words about my experience in, uh, in, and our company experience. Uh, as digital fingerprints, we protect more than uh, 1 million users. So we are generally trying to deal with the problem which I described before. To train models for this number of users, we have to look for models which are simple enough to be trained fast. And because of that, we are focusing more on algorithms based on decision trees, like uh, quite famous one, XGBoost, uh, which is really, really a super fast algorithm, uh, LightGBM, or those based on, uh, I can say, uh, hyperplane distances, like uh, support vector machine or K nearest neighborhoods, uh, a, a classic approaches from statistics to, to, to machine learning, transfer. Uh, or, we can also build uh, ensembles of uh, these uh, models. And generally, uh, these models are faster to train than neural networks. So let's go fluently to uh, neur neural networks. Hmm. What about neural networks? Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's a top trendy, cutting edge uh, technology about which everybody talk. You know, even, even outside data science or machine learning circle of people, you can find some, some people which are interested in neural networks. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's I can say, even, even a quite a fashion. Mm. But in the same time, and neural networks are data consuming and time consuming, which is a real problem in big scale model training. Uh, let's just look at the example on the right side of the slide. So uh, uh, let's look at Google Net architecture. This is uh, a classical example. It has uh, now it has a few years. So yeah, it's it's an it's an era. In, in machine learning, in, in neural networks. Uh, but still, um, this uh, architecture can give us a nice insight about how complicated neural network could be. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, citing Google AI block. Design of this network required many years of careful experimentation and refinement from initial versions of convolutional architecture. Yeah, the crucial word is many years. Of course, it's, yeah, it's a lot of time. Of course, it's a not typical problem for all of us. So we generally do not spend and we cannot spend years on building a, a model, even a, such a big model like GoogleNet. But it's typical problem that we have to spend a lot of time to build good, single good uh, neural network. Mm, so 
how, how we can use uh, neural networks in the case of this big scale training, in training uh, thousands of, of models. Uh, transfer learning could help. Mm. This machine learning method can significantly reduce model training for average user. Uh, how it works. So we can train one universal neural network on quite big sample of different users. And then for each user separately, we can train just a few last layers of the bigger, so this pre-trained network. Or sometimes we can just even train only some specific neurons from these layers. It's a more complicated approach, but it's possible. And it can even further reduce the training time. So the transfer learning is a recipe to reduce training time of single model, in this case, single neural network for each user, which makes this approach applicable to large scale model training. So thanks to that, we, we can thinking about and uh, experimenting with uh, neural networks in this big scale model in, in the case when we have to train many, many models. And uh, transfer learning is the most common in convolutional neural networks, but it can be also applicable to different neural networks too. So uh, we can find application of transfer learning to uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, it's uh, not as easy to find as uh, in the case of uh, convolutional neural networks. But if you will have uh, time and if you will go deeper into internet, into some white papers or blogs, you will find also uh, other application of transfer learning. Uh, be more precise, uh, hyperparameter optimization. So uh, we can try to reduce training time. And of course, it will be appreciated by our CFO. <laughs> but finally, machine learning project, machine learning model should give a good prediction. That's the, I can say, a KPI of each machine learning project. It should be good, the precision the quality of the prediction has to be uh, has to be good and normally that's the place for hyperparameter optimization and it's different types from simplest to implement and understand like random search or grid search uh, to more complicated like uh, genetic algorithm or bayesian search uh, okay genetic algorithm uh, I think that it's uh, it is really interesting idea to optimize uh, optimize hyperparameters and it's from my experience and the experience of my team quite efficient one uh, the source of inspiration is a Darwin theory of natural evolution so we have second example of inspiration in biology in, in case of machine learning. The first was the neural networks, and now we have the genetic algorithm. And the general idea is quite simple. We are creating first population of models, uh, and then we are calculating objective function for each model, each element of this population. Uh, best elements, uh, best models are transferred to next population, sometimes mutated, by change in one or more hyperparameter, uh, sometimes crossed with each other. So we, we choose uh, some hyperparameters from one element and the rest of hyperparameters from uh, the second element. And uh, we put them to the next population together. Hmm. This way, generation by generation, uh, best elements are passing their genes, which lead us to best model, best set of hyperparameters. Uh, okay, so let's get back to uh, the notion of big scale modeling. Uh, 
the problem of training many many users uh, in big scale model training it would be hard to use hyperparameter optimization in typical way the way which i already described uh, by by this typical approach i mean that we can run hyperparameter optimization for each model separately uh, we cannot do that in, in case of learning thousands of models uh, because of quite simple uh, the limit of time uh, so we have to look for alternative solution mm, and one of possible alternative solution is to collect user into groups and then uh, run hyperparameter optimization for whole group so we have to think about some kind of uh, segmentation in machine learning language uh, to to reduce the training time needed for uh, hyperparameter optimization and uh, one more time the amount of models so our problem of training many many models uh, doesn't allow us to use to use machine learning techniques in normal form so it forces us to look for an alternative solution we have to somehow modify uh, the basic approach we have to look for uh, some some changes in in this approach to adjust it to our problem which is really quite a pleasant job because you have to think you have to invent something make a, you have to uh, research some topics and uh, yeah it's uh, it's really nice but you do not have that you will succeed with this uh, okay so we talk about users uh, clustering user segmentation and here's an example of segmentation made by my colleague from a team and this segmentation is made with a Gaussian mixture model uh, on one of our keyboard feature which uh, which is developed in our company we've called this feature a uh, keyboard statistical data because more or less it's uh, some kind of uh, quite simple statistical analysis on uh pressing times of uh, on on a keyboard mm, dimensionality reduction on this feature was made through tsne method and uh, what we finally get is quite distinctive segmentation of each user so you can see it even on on, on this plot we get quite distinctive uh, segments and it's uh, it's really good uh, result because uh, we can use the segmentation later so we can uh, make use of this segmentation to uh, run hyperparameter optimization on a bunch of users so instead of uh, thinking how to run hyperparameter optimization user by user we can as i described before uh, run it on the whole segment because the segment is quite distinctive from other segments uh, we we have also experimented with other segmentation methods because uh, the segmentation is really important uh, problem in big scale modeling like uh, training of behavioral models we have to somehow group these users to optimize the hyperparameters which which lead us to uh, better quality uh, so the list of effective segmentation method in behavioral biometry is longer than just gaussian mixture model uh, from experience of my team i can say that uh, deep clustering uh, embedding uh, so D dec which is uh, nowadays uh, really really uh, strongly developed uh, method and 
theoretically, just uh, maybe not theoretically, but in just putting the, this idea simple, is uh, a hybrid of autoencoder, so another of typical and quite popular uh, neural network, and k-means, which is, uh, I can say, a classical statistical approach to uh, segmentation. Uh, it's the, the most popular, uh, I think that, yeah, the, that's the most popular uh, method of segmentation. Uh, another interesting method is dbscan, uh, which is um, also quite popular because it's implemented in scikit-learn uh, library in Python. So generally, I think that if you can find something in scikit-learn, uh it's uh, you could name it as a common method scikit learn is a must have type of library in, in python machine learning so uh, if you can find it in scikit learn that's uh, that's uh, quite common and uh, the one which we already discussed the gaussian mixture model uh so the the type of the model in which we are assuming that we are dealing with the mixture of Gaussian di distribution, so the mixture of normal distribution, and we are trying to model it through through this mixture. Uh, okay, that's uh, all I wanted to present you today. Thanks for your attention, and uh, I'm waiting for uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, it's not nice to hear that it was very interesting. Uh, the question is, what do you think? Is it possible to use individuals, mouse and keyboards uh, data as personal security measure? Uh, that's exactly our aim. That's what we are trying to do as, uh, as a company, as a startup. So we are developing a security uh, measure based on behavioral biometrics. Uh, uh, we have, I can say, on production, the models based on keyboards and partly on mouse. And we are also trying to go further with it. So we are trying to uh, deal with uh, mobile, which is, which is really a, a, a big problem in comparison to, to keyboard or mouse. Uh, in mobile, you have a lot of uh, sensors and uh, it's that's that's a really big data lake uh, using using this uh, case from a slide but uh, yeah generally uh, just putting the thing simple answering the question slightly uh, yes it's uh, i can say it's almost dedicated to be a security measure hmm. the second question uh, now we know what kind of type of date, uh, data needed to be collected, but uh, can you suggest uh, what tools to use to collect data? Mm, okay, uh, that's, uh, mm, that's the question for uh, which I should pass to, to my colleague because uh, he's uh, more focused on uh, data collecting, but generally we are, we are using uh, Cassandra as a tool to collect data and uh, that's uh, that's the tool which is responsible for data collecting of course we are uh, we are uh, wrote, wrote uh, some uh, our some tools by uh, by ourselves uh, but generally, the biggest part of the job, the main part of the job, uh, is made by Cassandra and Kafka, which is uh, just before Cassandra. So the transfer of data is through Kafka, and collection is made in Cassandra. And that's uh, as far as I know, because I'm not a specialist in, in this area. I'm rather a guy responsible for building this model. But uh, if... Uh, if I do not answer your question in 100%, just let me know and I will transfer this question to, uh, to my colleague, which is uh, uh, a um, really better specialist than me in this area. <laughs>